All right, well, hey, everybody, so glad you are at church today. Everybody here in Manion, do me a favor, help me welcome everybody watching from our other locations, yeah? <laughs> Center City, Fairmount, Roxboro, love you guys. So glad you're at church today. It's going to be a good one. I've been looking forward to this Sunday all week. Um, I've actually been looking forward to the weekend all week for a couple of reasons. First of all, on Friday, we had our first ever trunk or treat event. And uh, if you're wondering what that is, join the club. I didn't know what it was either. Um, so here's what it is. Uh, we, we rented this big parking lot over in Fairmount near our Fairmount location. And um, we set up a bunch of games for kids to play. And then we had a bunch of people decorate their trunks um, with a theme, a superhero theme, and pass out candy to kids. And they came by in their costumes. It was a ton of fun. A bunch of kids from the neighborhood came by. It was awesome. Uh, my kids left with a bunch of candy, which means that I now have access to a bunch of candy, <laughs> which is awesome, right? That's, that's a dad's dream. And uh, I know some of you are thinking, you shouldn't eat your kids' candy. You're wrong. You should eat your kids' candy. Let me tell you why I do it. I, I eat my kids' candy, some of it, uh, because I want my kids to know what the real world is like. I want them to know that everything you get is not yours, right? This is America. You pay taxes, right? And so long ago, when my children were itty-bitty, I instituted what I called a daddy tax. I say, you get some candy, so do I, right? And they even know the kind of candy I like. They go straight for the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. They walk right up to me. They hand it over to me, and they're like, Daddy, we good? I'm like, we're good. Go ahead and have all the rest of the candy you want as long as I got my Reese's peanut butter cut. So train up a child in the way they should go <laughs> when they're old. Not depart from That's Bible right there is what that is. So, so excited about that. Uh, also this weekend, excited about the game tonight, Eagles versus Cowboys. Come on, yeah? <laughs> Go Birds, excited about that. Yeah, man. Uh, I see that some of you Cowboys fans uh, dared to come to church with your Cowboys gear on. Um, don't, know, don't know why you'd want to come to church and start a fight, but, um, you know, we're down. Uh, no, no, no. God loves everybody. Maybe. Uh, so... So excited about that, but the thing I'm most excited about is wrapping up the series. Today, uh, I get to land the plane on, uh, on this series that we've been in called Ghost Stories, uh, which are not so scary stories about the Holy Spirit. And um, so let's pray, and then we'll jump right into the last part of our series, Ghost Stories. God, we love you, and we thank you so much that you first loved us. Lord, our prayer today is that you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we hear and the courage to do it. I pray that every single one of us will leave this place and, and leave our other locations this morning challenged and encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right, so for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. And if you've missed either of the past two messages, I want to encourage you to make sure you go online, take some time, and uh, uh, go to Epic uh, epic.church, and all the messages are there for you. As long as there's an internet, they will be there. So you can go and check those out and catch up on this series, uh, because it's really important to me that you know who the Holy Spirit is, and it's really important to me that you know what the Holy Spirit's role in your life could and should be. In fact, the very first thing we talked about in this series was that the Holy Spirit is an important part of who God is, right? And we said that there's, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. It's called the Trinity. And, and, and so many of us are okay with like God the Father because we know him like our Heavenly Father. He's our creator. He made us. We get that, right? We understand that. Uh, lots of us are okay with, with God the Son. It's Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. He forgives our sin. We understand that. We get that. But then there's the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's where some of us kind of pump the brakes a little bit because we're like, what does he do? Like, what's, what's, what's his job? How does that work, you know? I mean, even the name Holy Spirit just by itself feels a little spooky. It's like, yeah, like, I, I don't know about all that. I'm okay with God the Father, God the Son, there you go. But I don't know about all that. And my hope is that this series has helped take away some of the mystery of it all. That this series for you has helped wipe away some of the fog because here's the deal. God does not want you to just know him as your creator. And God does not just want you to know him as your savior. There's even more to God than all of that. And what we've learned in this series is that the way for you and I to experience and know that even more part of who God is, is through the Holy Spirit. And it's not so spooky. It's actually very practical. I think that's part of the reason why before Jesus left the earth, he kept telling his disciples over and over again, he kept saying, hey, soon, I'm going to leave. But when I do, don't worry. 
It's gonna be okay. In fact, here's probably how I would say it. Soon, I'm gonna leave, but it's for your benefit. It's actually best for you that I go because after I go, the Holy Spirit's gonna come. And if you think what you've seen so far is cool, get ready, because you ain't seen nothing yet. And that is the Kent Jacobs version of the Bible, in case you're one, you're like, that ain't the Bible, that's my Bible. That one I made up right now. So, uh, but there is a verse that's very similar to that. It's, it's John chapter 16, verse seven, for all you fact checkers out there, right? Because you, you've been watching the election, you know, look, someone just showed me, they're like, where's it at? You know, so, all right, there you go. That's where it's at, John 16, verse seven. So today, I, I wanna actually pick up where, where I left off a couple weeks ago. And, and so we're gonna do a quick drive-by of the verses that we looked at the first week, and because they lead right into uh, the part of the narrative or part of the story that I wanna share with you today, all right? Because, because here's the thing. I wanna talk to you about what actually happened when the Holy Spirit showed up. So Acts chapter one, Jesus comes back from the dead. He he spends about 40 days with his disciples and other people, uh, eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness accounts that Jesus raised from the dead. So everybody's like, oh, he is who he said he was, okay? And, and, And during that time, he has a conversation with his disciples that goes as follows. Acts chapter one, starting verse number four. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so here it is, he's saying, hey, I'm leaving, but it's okay because there's a gift that's coming and it's the Holy Spirit. Verse six, then they gathered around him and they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And here's why they asked that question. Um, Israel at that time was under Roman oppression. And so they're thinking, hey, since you just came back from the dead and proved to everybody that you really are God and you've got the power, how about we get rid of Rome, right? Let's, let's, let's send them on their way, right? We'll be our own kingdom here. And so they said, hey, are we gonna kick, we gonna kick the Romans out? Verse seven, look how he answers. He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the father has set his own, by his own authority. Now, I read that and it's almost like he just kind of ignores the question that they ask. And, and I love that he ignores their question because it makes me feel better about the times when I feel like Jesus ignores my questions. <laughs> but you ever had a question, you're like, God, is it time? And he's just like, it is not for you to know. I was like, well, thanks. That's great. So he goes on, verse eight, right? He says, he, says, he goes on to what's really important. He says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will, and and this is what you'll have the power to do, this is important later, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's gonna empower you in ways that you've never experienced before. So much so, it's gonna change the whole world. Verse nine, after he said this, he was taken up before, look, look how this ends. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So so he says this thing to him and then all of a sudden he just disappears up into the sky, which I think has to be the coolest and most impressive way that a conversation has ever been ended in all of history, right? Is that not the coolest? I mean, he's like, like, hey, the Holy Spirit's coming, deuces, I'm out. I mean, they're just standing there. They're just like, you think he's coming back? I don't know. He came back once, three days. I don't, we should just stand here. (laughs) Finally, they give up. They go on their way. And that's where we pick up the story. 10 days later, Acts chapter two, verse number one. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So there they are, they're just hanging out and suddenly they hear the sound of hurricane force winds. Can you imagine if that just happened, like just right now, if that happened? 
Like you'd, you'd leave. You'd run for the exit. You'd be like, got to go. I don't know what they're doing there, but got to leave, right? Right, that'd be a freaky thing. Whenever I was a kid, uh, we lived three years on the island of Guam uh, in the Pacific. And um, Guam, just like, just like Florida has a hurricane season, Guam has a typhoon season. And they're both the same thing, just two different words. Um, but it's a time where these big storms come. And the very first typhoon that I ever went through was Typhoon Omar, it was 1992. Uh, sustained winds of 120 miles an hour, gusts up to 150 miles an hour. And listen, I'd never seen anything like this in my entire life. I was from North Carolina where they had big thunderstorms. Like this was for real. I mean, it blew my mind. I looked out the window and everything and anything that wasn't tied down was it just gone. It just gone. It didn't move across the yard, didn't move down to the neighbors, wasn't down the street, just got just sucked up into nothingness. Just gone. Not only that, I sat there and watched palm trees wave back and forth like grass in the wind. It was it was a frightening sight, but the thing I remember most is the sound of the wind. It was terrifying, trust me. And so all of a sudden, the sounds of this crazy windstorm kicks up. And it's so loud we find out later that, that people in other parts of the city came running to hear or, or find out what the sound was. And, and so, so this is all happening. And then it gets worse because at this time a fire breaks out. And it's not any kind of a fire. Verse three, we'll see. Verse three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. <laughs> no. Right, are you with me? Like at that point, I'm like, no, 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 I quit. I'm time out. Time out. Like, stop. Whatever's going on here, I do not want to be part of this thing. Are you serious? Fire? Like, they look up, there's a fireball in front of them. It separates into all these little flames, and each one of those flames goes and starts flickering above people's heads. Are you kidding me? Like, can you imagine how that played out? They're like, dude. The other guy looks back, he's like, uh-uh, look at you, you too. And the guy's like, oh. Like, what would you do in that moment? I'd be like, <laughs> I'd try to blow it out, man. I'd like, blow this thing out, it's dangerous. <laughs> Little flames just start flickering above people's heads. This is crazy, you know? Verse four, all of them, now here, it moves on, something gets worse. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak fluently in all these other languages that they didn't speak before this moment. Verse five. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd of them together in bewilderment, um, because each one heard their own language being spoken. So there's all these different spe people who speak all these different languages, and all of a sudden, they can hear people who didn't speak their language speaking their language. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? They said, listen, they don't speak our language. How are they doing it? Fluently, perfectly. What is going on? Verse nine, Parthians, uh, um, Midis, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Um, how you say that? <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pamphylia, which, if you got Pamphylia, you need to go to the doctor. I just, <laughs> Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And I wrote in my notes, I bet they did. I bet they were like, what does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they had too much wine. They said, these people drunk. <laughs> then Peter stood up and the 11 raised his voice, uh, with the 11, and he raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Now watch what Peter does. 
stands up. He addresses the crowd. He says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. And look at his reason why. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> you should read the Bible. It's fascinating. These people ain't drunk. It's nine o'clock. It's too early to be drunk, is what he says. And I guess that's an okay argument. But, but I'm thinking if I was there and if I was making the argument, I'd be like, hey, guys, they're speaking perfect Parthenian. Do you speak perfect Parthenian when you get drunk? No. You know why? Because getting drunk makes you dumber. It doesn't make you a linguistic specialist. Are you serious right now? Anyways. <laughs> Isn't this a crazy passage? Now, I want to pause right here. Because as much as I would want you to know that the Holy Spirit isn't weird, and as much as you would hear me say, and trust me, I made this very clear in the first week, if you think the Holy Spirit's weird, it's probably because there was a person who was doing weird things in the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay? As much as I would want you to know that, as much as I would say that, as much as, you know, team not weird, trust me, team not weird, I think it's also really important that we realize and recognize that God is God and that he can and will do things that will leave us not just amazed like they were, but perplexed like they were, you know? See, in and, and with that, if and when that happens in our life, just like those people, I think we have a choice to make. We can either allow that amazement and perplexity to lead us to a place where we pursue God more deeply because we have questions. Like, what does that mean? I want to know. Is that for real or not? Or we can allow it to let us to move to a place of skepticism where we're cynical and maybe eventually where we become mocking. In fact, that's kind of what happens here, right? Like some of them looked at this and they couldn't understand it. They couldn't make sense of it. And so because they couldn't understand it and because they couldn't make sense of it, they just dismissed it. They said, all those people just must be drunk. Listen, there's no way that we could do three weeks about the Holy Spirit and we not take a moment to acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit does supernatural things that we can't explain all the time. He just does. The truth is that, that there's probably three groups of people here. There, there are some of you that are here that have had amazing confusing, but unmistakable encounters with the Holy Spirit. And you wouldn't trade that for the world because it's a big part of your story. And you wouldn't trade that for the world because of how much it means to you. There are others of us here who, who have heard about amazing, perplexing, confusing things about the Holy Spirit. And it makes you ask the question, what does this mean like them? Like you genuinely have questions and you genuinely want to know some answers. And then there's a group of people where, where you've, you've heard or, uh, or maybe seen or experienced some things about the Holy Spirit and because you couldn't explain it away, it led you to a place of skepticism and then cynicism and then contempt and then ultimately to rejection. And, and all I'm saying is that, man, I would hate for you to miss something that God would want to do in your life because it doesn't fit neatly into the box that you created for God to fit into. Do you know what I'm saying? Like he's God. He doesn't always fit neatly into our little boxes that we create. Now let me, let me be really clear, right? Definitely team not weird over here. Okay. We're not going to pull out snakes. We're not drinking Kool-Aid today. All right. Not happening. At the same time, I don't ever want to put God in a box because he's God. And if there is something more for me to experience in my life that God wants for me, then I want to experience that. And man, I would want that for you too. Absolutely, in every way, at the same time. Weird for the sake of weird? Please no. You know? Please no. Wrong church. Get to stepping. <laughs> I've heard too many stories about amazing and confusing things for me to stand and say that God may not have done some of those things, that God wasn't in some of those things. And truthfully, I've experienced too many amazing and confusing things to say that God wasn't or couldn't have been a part of those things. Not weird, but like, wow, 
Only God could have done that. Only God could have done that. I just don't want you to miss anything that God might want for you to experience. Listen, truth is that God sometimes does supernatural stuff. And when the Holy Spirit finally showed up in downtown Jerusalem all those years ago, what happened was just that. It was supernatural. Now, I know that, that these three things that happened, they seem random and they seem unconnected. It's like, like, what is that about? But actually, there's some meaning here if you dig a little deeper. See, first, we see the sound of the wind. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the word for spirit is actually uh, um, breath or wind. And so, in a sense, this was God's way of announcing that the Holy Spirit has actually arrived. Second, there's that fire that kind of separates and, and is equally dispersed to all the people that were there. And what's interesting about that is we see that it's equally dispersed to everybody, not just the disciples, but everyone, right? Not just to the men, but to the women too. Not just to the older seasoned veteran spiritual people that were in the room, but to the young people too, right? And I think here God is saying that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not just for a special select few, but it's for everyone. It's not just for the clergy or the preacher guy. It's not just for the religious types. No, God's presence and power in your life is for you, for you and you and you and me and all of us, right? If you're a follower of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is for you too, every single one of us. And then the third thing that we see there is that they spoke every language. Like all the different people who were there and all the different languages that they spoke, that they spoke they spoke in that moment every single language. Not one was left out. And I think that's God's way of saying that the message of God's love for people and the message of God's love for this planet and the message of God's love for this world should be something that goes to every culture, on every continent, in every place. Like within minutes of the Holy Spirit showing up, God makes it clear that the message of hope that's found through Jesus is a message that's global. It's for everybody, everywhere. And with the next few minutes, I, I, I wanna share with you some of what the Holy Spirit went on to do in the lives of just some normal, everyday people like me and you. Now, the first one I wanna point to is this guy named Peter. Right, we just, we just heard about him. He, he stood up and he, he started talking and said, no, they're not drunk, it's 9 a.m. in the morning, right? So he starts, he starts saying this thing and then, and then we, see, we see that like just before that, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and then without skipping a beat, he stands up and then for the next 20 verses in this passage, I'm not gonna read them, but you can read them yourself. He preaches what is one of the greatest sermons that's ever been preached. Now here's what you need to know. Peter wasn't a preacher. Peter was a fisherman. Like, <laughs> he was a fisherman. He wasn't a preacher. And up until this point, there's no evidence that he'd ever stood up in front of anybody and ever addressed a crowd. And then out of nowhere, all of a sudden, he stands up and preaches this incredible, powerful sermon. He's got no notes. He's just shooting from the hip. And we see that the Holy Spirit actually gives him the words to say as he shares the message of Jesus. And, and that's actually a promise that we see in Acts chapter 1. Remember that verse that the Holy Spirit would give you power to be my witnesses? That's what Jesus said in, in Acts chapter one. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and give you the power to be my witnesses. He says, whenever, whenever there's the opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus to someone who needs to hear it, the promise is that the Holy Spirit will give you the supernatural power to be able to do so. Even give you the words to say, are you serious? And isn't that frightening? Like many of us were like, what? You want me to say words about God? How's that even start? It's like, so what do you think about God? That's the worst intro ever. It's like, what? We're frightened. But gang, I'm just saying that we need to be looking for those opportunities. Because if we, if we pass on them, I think we're missing out on the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to do something incredible, supernatural, divine even, in and through our lives. Are you serious? That's not just for the preacher. 
That's for anybody who's discovered hope in life through Jesus. Like we all should be able to share that. All should want to be able to share that. And God says, I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit to help you do that. Listen, I'm just saying, if we'll just trust God in this way, I think you might be surprised at what God might do as a result. I know for a fact that Peter was surprised. Look what happened, uh, Acts chapter two, verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized <laughs> and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000? A few days ago, we were really excited because 63 people got baptized. <laughs> Can you imagine if it was 3,000, we'd still be there dunking people. <laughs> 3,000 people. And can you imagine the other disciples? They were probably looking at Peter like, whoa. Like afterwards, like, Pete, we didn't even know you could preach. He's like, I didn't either. It just kind of happened. I just stood up and started talking and poof. Whoa. Only God could do that. The Holy Spirit. You know there's something called the gifts of the Spirit? And do you know that all of us have gifts from the Holy Spirit? As you, when you become a follower of Jesus and you ask God to fill your life, ask him to fill your life, he actually gives you gifts, abilities. That's a thing. Listen, I want to say it as clearly as I know how to say it. Most of you either work or go to school somewhere, right? Right? Listen, God loves the people that you work with. God loves the people that you go to school with. And you aren't a part of their life by accident. In fact, we've said this before. I believe that you're strategically positioned by God in someone else's life to help them make a connection to him. Like you're strategically positioned by God in someone else's life to help them make a connection to him. And I'm just saying that if we'll wake up every single day and say, God, Hey, if you'll open up the opportunity for me to speak to someone who needs you today, then I, I'm going to trust you enough to open up my mouth and trust that you'll fill it. And I know, I know part of you is saying, you know, ah, but I don't, I don't know what to say. You don't have to know what to say. And God promises to help you with that. It's like, but I don't know any Bible verses. You don't have to know any Bible verses. You just have to know your story. That's it. You just need to be able to tell your story. One of my favorite people in the church is a guy named Mark Crown, Mark and Kim. And uh, they've been part of the church for about seven years now, moved here from Chicago. And uh, they're actually moving back to Chicago in just a couple of weeks. So really sad about that, bummed about it. Been a big part of what God's done in and through the church over the last seven years and supported in big ways and pretty special. Yeah. I went to his, their little going away thing yesterday and Mark was telling me, he's like, yeah, man. So for the last little bit, Mark's been driving Uber and, uh, and Lyft. He's been doing that. So I think that's the other one. And so uh, as part of that, he says, yeah, sometimes people get in the car and they're super chatty. Like they just want to talk. He's like, so, so I talk to him and, and it's crazy when you're an Uber driver, like people just like tell you their stories and tell you about parts of their life and they just go on and on. And he's like, I just have these opportunities all day long to just like say these little encouraging things and point them in a better direction. He's like, and then at the end, when there's the opportunity, I just, kinda, I just pull out one of the Epic Church cards and I'm like, hey man, you really need to find a group of people that are coming alongside you and help you, and encourage you, challenge you, give you information that's gonna, gonna help your heart. And you need to be in a good place. You should, you should check this out. He's telling me this. I'm like, what, what in the world is this? I don't know. Like part of me is like, yeah. And part of me is like, mm, I don't know. And like, like God's in that, I'm sure. And that's, that's awesome. And I'm like, dude, you're the, you're the Uber evangelist? What is that? Like what is, <laughs> it's a thing now, the Uber evangelist? And but you know, I'm just so proud of Mark. You know why? He just says, God, if, if you open up the opportunity, I'm just gonna trust you enough to be bold enough to say something and just point people to the same hope that I found. And who knows? Who knows what God's gonna do because of that or what God's already done because of that? Listen, you can do this. You just need to be brave enough to speak when the opportunity arises I know you're saying, but I don't know what to say. It's okay. God, the Holy Spirit will help you with that, you know, right? Can you imagine if we all did that, just looked for opportunities and just, right, just told our story, just said an encouraging thing? Can you imagine if all 1,500 of us did that every week? It could change a city. And even if it didn't, even if it just changed one person's heart, 
Wouldn't that be worth it? Now, the second person I want to tell you about in the Holy Spirit at work in their life is not a person. It's, it's, actually, it's actually a group of people. In the last six verses of this chapter here, Acts chapter 2, we're introduced to this incredible description of what is the first church. And it, this is actually a group of people that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, ends up changing the whole world with. I kid you not. Acts chapter two, starting verse number 42, we learn about them. Here's what the scripture says. It says that they, talking about this group of people, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Gang, I I think the most important word in that whole phrase is devoted because it describes who these people were. They were totally devoted. Devoted to the apostles' teaching, to, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Listen, the devotion of a people in a church is probably the most important characteristic about them. See, without devotion, churches slowly die. It's true. You ever look at a church, it's like dying. You're like, why? Why is that happening? You ever see a church with a for sale sign outside? It's like, why? Like, why? That's supposed to be a place of hope and life. And like, what? what's going on there? Churches that are filled with, with half-hearted, low-passion, uncommitted people don't go anywhere. It's true. Without devotion, the poor are never served. Without devotion, teams are never filled and people are never really cared for like they should be. Without devotion, faith is never shared with other people who need to hear it. Without devotion, there aren't ever enough resources for the church to do what God's called the church to do. And let's face it, without devotion, the church is dead in the water. It's true. The vision will never be realized and its mission will never be accomplished. But when the people of a church say, God, I want to be full, fully devoted. When the people of a church say, God, I want to be, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. When a people of a church has high levels of devotion to God and high levels of devotion to his church, then that church is nearly unstoppable. Its potential is unlimited. Its vision is achievable and its mission is attainable. And so, so here's, I want to drew this out for you. I just wanted you to look at this. If you were to look at this continuum from, from low devotion to, to high devotion, and I were to give you a marker and ask you to to come up and and place your initials somewhere on this as it relates to your devotion to God and your devotion to his church. Like where where would you put your initials, right? Like like that verse, verse 42, it says they they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? And to fellowship. They were totally devoted to breaking bread and to prayer. He says there, he says, when it came to gathering together, when it came to them getting together to, to worship God together, to sing songs to him, to, to hear God's word taught, to, to, to be challenged by that, encouraged by that, when it came to their gathering, to their assembling, they were totally devoted to that. Like it was, it was one of the highest priorities on their calendar. So how about you? Like when it comes to, when it comes to this, what happens on Sunday morning and being here, where, where would you put your initial... Is it like the first thing that goes on the calendar? I'm blocked off for Sunday mornings because there's something important that happens then. Or is it like, ah, if I'm not, you know, sleeping or if it's not raining or if there's not someone in town or if, you know, I didn't stay up late the night before. It's like, what? Like, where would you, like, where's your devotion when it comes to that? Verse 45, it says, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. What? Like when somebody in their group needed something, they sold their own stuff to help meet that need. Are you kidding me? Do you know what that is? That's full devotion when it comes to your resources. That's full devotion when it comes to the money that God has entrusted to you. So here's the question. Do you have high levels of devotion or low levels of devotion when it comes to that? Like we're almost at the end of 2016. And so most of us for, the, for this past year, we've received a paycheck every month or every two weeks or every one week or however, however long, you know, whatever your interval is. If you look back over this last year, what, what would your level of devotion be, right? 
Like if you have, if you have low devotion as it relates to what God's entrusted to you, then, then you know, you've probably blown through most of that and kind of you know, maybe racked up some debt and all that kind of stuff and you don't really live within your means and, and, and you, haven't, you haven't honored God with that and done what he asked us to do, which is to give a percentage back to him. So that, that has to happen if you're down here. If, if you're high devotion, then, then you're the place where, where you realize that every paycheck that you get is a sign of God's provision in your life. And you're excited to, to live within your means and you're excited to honor God by doing what he asked you to do and give a percentage back to him and say, God, I just want to acknowledge, I realize that everything I have comes from you in the first place. It's all yours. And so I just want to trust you and honor you and I want your blessing in this area of my life. So I'm going to, I'm going to trust you in this way. I'm going to give back to you what's yours, right? You'd be on the high side. Uh, verse 46, it says, it says, they broke bread in their homes together with glad and sincere hearts. I love this part of the verse. It's, it's, it's so important because it tells us that these people, it shows us that they, they couldn't stand the idea of going seven more days before they could meet together again. They, they couldn't stand the idea of going seven more days before they could be with, with other people that were like-minded and like-hearted that would encourage each other and pray for each other and like know what's going on in each other's life. And so they're so devoted to that that they said, you know what? Hey, let's meet this week. Like, let's, let's just have, let's have dinner together. Let's play games together. Let's go to a movie together. Let's just hang out. I just, when, when I'm around you, you encourage me and I encourage you. Let's just, let's just do that, right? These people understand that there's something that happens in circles that just doesn't happen in rows. And listen, I'm not against the rows. We love the rows. Rows are awesome. But there's something about a circle. When someone knows your name and you know theirs and, and you know what's going on, what's up, what's down in their life, and they know what's up and down in yours, and you can encourage each other and pray with one another and challenge each other. And there's just something about a circle that's different than all these rows. See, these people understood that they were better together, right? Right? And they didn't need a preacher to convince them. They just knew it was true. In verse 47, that's how it wraps up. Praising God. They praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And get this, here's what happened as a result. You ready? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I love that. I mean, God did this thing where just more and more people kept finding hope and life through Jesus. And it was like this growing community of people that like had each other's back and helped each other and were with each other and, and were on mission together to make a difference in their world. And God just kind of was like all about this thing. Who wouldn't want to be part of a community like this? Something supernatural was happening there every day. And I'm convinced that so much of it goes back to that word in verse 42, devoted, devoted. Listen, guys, when there's low devotion, the church crawls and the spiritual life of people in the church crawls too. But when there's high devotion, when there's full on devotion, when, when people will say, you know, God, if you tell us to go, we'll go. And if you tell us to stop, we'll stop. And if you, if, if, if you want us to give, we'll give. And if you want us to, God, whatever it is you want us to do, we just want to do that thing. When there's, when there's full devotion, high devotion, man, the church soars. And so does the life of those who are fully devoted. You know, you know what the key to this whole thing for me is? It's this one thought. God has only ever given his absolute best for me. Like God has only ever given his absolute best for me. Like when I needed a creator is the best creator there could be, right? When, when I needed a heavenly father, he's the best heavenly father I could have. Whenever I needed someone to be the forgiver of my sin, to pay the price for my sin, God gave his son and it was the best sacrifice he could possibly give, Jesus, right? Whenever God looked down and saw that I needed help to live out this life, then he sent me the Holy Spirit who's the best helper I could possibly have. Whenever scripture talks about our home in heaven, it says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, what God has in store. I mean, it's the best it could possibly be. God has only ever given his absolute best for me. How can I not give my best for him? Like, like 95% seems about 5% too short. 
doesn't it? I mean, I could understand if we had a low devotion God. Like I could understand if we had a, a low devotion Jesus or, or a low devotion Heavenly Father or a low devotion Holy Spirit, but he's all the way over here and he's only ever been all the way over here. And so I just have to, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. If he's all the way over here, how can we be? You know what I'm saying? And I listen, don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about some legalistic, you know, you got to work my way into God's good graces and try to be good enough and all this kind of stuff and be better than them. And oh, look at me and not them. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm just talking about the, the, the posture of our hearts. Our heart needs to be God. I just want to be fully devoted. Like whatever that looks like, I don't want to be full on devoted, right? So I think the obvious question for us is, well, if there's parts of my life that are low devotion, then how do I get over. You know what I think part of the answer is? I think part of the answer is asking the Holy Spirit for help. I think part of the answer is saying, God, I I need you to do in my life what I can't do on my own because I want to be fully devoted. Like, you've only ever given your absolute best for me. I want to give my absolute best for you. I think it's asking the Holy Spirit to help us with that. I really do. As we land this whole series, I mean, I just want to be a church full of people that say, God, hey, I'm not much, but here's what I got. I just think there's something powerful about that. I think God responds to people like that. You see, I don't, I don't think it's an accident that the greatest moment in Peter's life happened on the hills of him being filled with the Holy Spirit and just surrendering and saying, all right, God, just, just all of me. I don't think that the greatest moments in Jesus's life happened after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, he lived 30 years and then he did three years of ministry. You know what happened right in the middle of those two things? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not that Jesus needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit as much as I think he's just modeling for us that we need to have a heart that wants to be filled with God, whatever that looks like, you know? And I don't think it's an accident that the greatest movement that's ever happened on planet Earth took place on the heels of a group of people being filled with the Holy Spirit you realize God changed the whole world with that church. Like it's the only institution. That's, I mean, the Roman Empire has come and gone, but the church is still here. I don't think it's an accident. So I look at this and I think about what God did in the first century and I think to myself, man, if God could do that then, why can't he do that now? Why can't he do that here? Why he can't he do that with us? Like in our day, in our time, right? Like if God could do that in the first century and completely change the whole world, why can't he do it in Philadelphia now? Like has God, like has God fallen off the throne? Has the Holy Spirit lost his stuff? No. You know what I think it takes? I think it just takes a group of people. I said, God, if you said go, we'll go. Stop, we'll stop. Give, we'll give. Love, we'll love. Follow, we'll follow. And then I was thinking, you know what happened as a result? God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Then I thought, gosh, we started the church in 2008, right? I was like, gosh, daily, that would be 365 times eight years. I didn't do the math because I didn't have a calculator. (laughs) But you know how many people have made a decision to follow Jesus since we started the church in 2008? As of a couple weeks ago, it was 4,014 people. You know what that is? No, 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 no. You know what that is? And that is a reason to celebrate, but let me get to the point. You know what that is? You know what that sounds like? That sounds like God adding to their number daily those who are being saved. That sounds like God adding 
to their number more than daily. This, this isn't a movement we're waiting on. This is a movement that's begun. And I just want to be people that are fully devoted, right? Because everything is better when God's at the center of it. And your life is better when God's at the center of it. And my life is better when God's at the center of it. And your money's better when God's at the center of it, right? And I'm telling you, listen, your, your career is better when God's at the center of it. Every part of your life is better. Every part of you, every part of this world, everything that exists is better when God's at the center of it. And so we just gotta be people that are willing to keep walking that way. Oh, what God could do. It changed the whole world or at least every person in the city. Amen? You with me? Yes. We gonna get it? Yes. All right, I'm with me too. Let's go do this. I'm with me too. <laughs> and let's do this. Um, I wanna pray that, I wanna pray that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit, that God would fill me up, right? That word fill is actually means continue to be filled. And I, I told you just the first week, and here's the reason why it says you need to be continually filled with God's presence and God's power. It's because you leak. So do I, yeah. right? Like come Tuesday, like we run it on E, we need to, right? So I'm just gonna pray that God would fill us as a church and that we'd keep taking steps toward being high devotion people and um, keep seeing what God does as a result, all right? Let's do that. God, I thank you for every person here and every person at our other locations. I pray your blessing in their life. And God, I pray that you fill us up. God, help us to be people that are obedient. When you say go, we'll go and stop and stop. And God, where we find ourselves weak, where the, there's the things that we wanna do but we don't do, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us. God, I pray that you'd be our comforter and our helper. God, we trust you for that. We can't wait to see what you do as a result of us taking steps towards you. In Jesus' name, amen.